Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar series. Uh, our presentation today is entitled Imaging Flow Cytometry for the Detection of Sub-Visible Particles in Therapeutic Protein Formulations. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. Currently, a major concern for the biopharmaceutical industry is the formation of protein aggregates and other sub-visible particles during manufacturing, shipping, and storage, as they can have negative impacts on drug activity and lead to unwanted immunogenicity in patients. It is critical that accurate and effective methods are employed to determine the size and abundance of any protein aggregates formed during the production of therapeutic samples. The challenge, however, in analyzing protein aggregates lies in the unknown nature of the formed aggregates. Many researchers are beginning to overcome these obstacles by utilizing imaging analysis platforms that combine the statistical power of fluorescent sensitivity of standard flow cytometry with the spatial resolution and quantitative morphology of digital microscopy. Our first speaker today, David Vulcan, is a distinguished professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at the University of Kansas. Dr. Vulcan will discuss his research into improving analytical methods for refining the visual, visualization and characterization of protein aggregates. Dr. Vulcan will be followed by Christine Probst, who is an application scientist at Amnes Corporation, which is part of EMD Millipore. Christine will describe her work on identifying particle formation and therapeutic samples using imaging flow cytometry. Before our speakers get started, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We will try and answer as many questions as we can and simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. So without any more ado, let's get our webinar underway. Uh, David, you have our attention. Hi, uh, this is uh, David Vulcan. I'm a professor at the University of Kansas, and I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News and EMD Millipore for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. And I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you about work that has come out of our lab in the last year or so uh, to better characterize protein aggregates and subvisible particle formation. I'm also a, a director of a center that we have at the University of Kansas called the Macromolecule and Vaccine Stabilization Center. And in the next slide, I'm providing the, uh, the web address. So if you're interested in some of the work that I'm uh, talking about today, uh, please go to our website to get more information. Focus my talk uh, on um, some of the causes and, and mechanisms of protein aggregation and, and particle formation. And uh, this is of concern in the pharmaceutical industry uh, because of the tendency of protein-based therapeutics to aggregate and or form particles during long-term storage or during accidental exposure to environmental stresses. Uh, the formation of aggregates and particles is of concern because it could increase to it could lead to an increase in immune response uh, against the drug, and or decrease the efficacy of the drug. And the way I like to think about this is in three steps. We need to consider the, uh, as shown in the left side, hand side of the slide, we need to consider the protein itself and the intrinsic stability of the protein. Uh, proteins vary widely in terms of their intrinsic stability. Uh, solubility and physical chemical properties. The next thing to consider is the environment around the molecule. That would be the formulation. This can be things like the uh, solution pH, the additives, buffering excipients. And then the third thing to consider is uh, the stress that could be applied to that uh, formulated protein solution. Uh, the, the, the most common stress, which actually I don't have listed in the slide here, is, is time during long-term storage. But during, uh, other stresses include exposure to temperature, light, freeze-thaw, shaking, etc. And so these three um, categories, the protein, the formulation, and the stress, can lead to different types of aggregates and particles. In the next slide, I highlight that uh, protein aggregates and particles can form in a variety of different size ranges. Uh, and if you look at the bottom 
uh, x-axis, you can see we're covering several orders of magnitude of size from nanometer size soluble aggregates in solution to moving up to submicron to subvisible, all the way to visible particles that can be seen by the eye. And as we move across the size spectrum of aggregates, we can see that different analytical techniques are required, uh, and, and, and each analytical technique has its strengths and weaknesses in terms of characterizing soluble aggregates and characterizing uh, larger particulates depending on their size. So what I would like to do in uh, today's presentation is go through three case studies from our lab that are going to look at different aspects of um, protein aggregation and particle formation. The first case study is entitled Structural Characterization of IgG MAB Aggregates and Particles Generated Under Various Stress Conditions, and it was published in 2014 in J Farm Sci. The, this work um, uh, highlights um, the need, and it's, it, this is shown on the bottom of the slide, to not only in size and count particles, but also to better characterize the particles in terms of the morphology, in terms of the uh, structure of the protein entrapped within the particles. And so this work is a, a case study uh, looking at a variety of different analytical tools shown in the flow sheet in the middle of the slide. Uh, after we expose an antibody solution to different stresses, either freeze-thaw, shaking, stirring, or heating. In the next slide is a summary uh, from the paper about um, the effect of uh, the four different stresses on the amount of particles and, and the size of particles that are forming. So uh, just to walk through this, uh, on the top of the table is uh, a list of the different uh, analytical methods to measure par uh, aggregates and particles of different size, size exclusion chromatography, SEC, to look at smaller aggregates, uh, NTA, uh, nanocyte technology, to look at submicron uh, size particles, MFI, to look at subvisible particles, and solution turbidity and visual assessments to, to uh, give an overall assessment of the, of the clarity of the solution. If we um, look at the effect of stresses, and I'll just walk you through through one example, uh, the freeze thaw is the mildest stress, uh, and particles only formed in the presence of sodium chloride. So if we go to the table, we look at the minus sodium chloride, you'll see minus all the way across, which means upon freeze thaw, we didn't see any increase in particles or aggregates by this method. method. Uh, the next row, we added salt, did the same experiment, so we see three plus signs appeared for insoluble aggregates by size exclusion and submicron and subvisible particles by nanocyte and MFI. And you look on the far right, uh, that summarized that three out of eight conditions uh, changed when we added salt. Now for the other three conditions, though we're, those are more harsh compared to freeze thaw, and that is seen by uh, plus signs in the turbidity and visual assessment column, as well as differences in NTA and MFI. So uh, we can see that different stresses lead to different uh, amounts and sizes of aggregates, and that can be affected by the presence of salt, which in turn is related to the mechanism, which I'll be discussing a little later. Going to the next slide, uh, we're now moving beyond sizing and counting particles and, and assessing the effect of these stresses on morphology and composition. So the MFI is able to uh, which takes digital images, is able to analyze um, the morphology of the particles, and that's shown in the table on the left. We have particles varying from 2.5 up to 100 microns in size, and then across the table from the different stresses. And, and for today, we can just summarize that saying different stresses lead to varying size and, and different um, morphologies. Uh, to just maybe highlight one or two, the stirring uh, leads to denser particles, and those appear uh, as darker um, in the pictures. And, and, and shaking, also in the middle, you can see a uh, tendency towards uh, fiber-like uh, particle formation. We actually also use, uh, and this is shown on the left, uh, electron microscopy to take an even closer look at the morphology of the particles, and I can highlight that the stirring uh, 
showed the formation of, of spherical particles, while the other stresses were mostly mesh-like. We then uh, collected the particles and ran SDS page to analyze for the presence of covalent cross-linking. And what we can see in this gel, which is a summary of two of the four conditions, stirring and heating, that on the left, the non-reduced um, uh, samples, we, we did see higher molecular weight aggregates that are, are highlighted in the circle. And that when we added reducing agent, they um, are, are, uh, are, uh, are reduced and, and they're no longer present. And so we can see that reducible high molecular species are observed uh, upon uh, heating and stirring. We did not see that with the other two stresses, and I'm not showing that data. In the next slide, we use FTIR to examine the overall secondary structure of the protein within the particle, and we compare that to two controls. And the two controls are on the top, uh, which is the control antibody, which is native structure, and a a extensively heated antibody, which is a uh, denatured control. And I don't have time to go through the details of FTIR, but you can see there's a, a main peak at 1637 um, inverse uh, centimeters wavelength uh, with the native, that, and that in the denatured sample, that peak disappears and a new peak appears at about 1620 or so. And uh, that corresponds from a change from the native intramolecular beta peaks to the uh, intermolecular beta uh, sheets um, uh, or, ag uh, or aggregates. Uh, we then, on the bottom, uh, look at the uh, isolated particles from the, the stress samples, and we compare them to our controls. And we can see that the overall structure of the protein within the particles varies from native-like native to structurally altered depending on the stress. We can also assess the conformation of the protein within the particle by its uh, interaction with an extrinsic fluorescent dye. And this dye and this is called ANS. And ANS uh, fluorescence greatly increases when it's in a more hydrophobic environment compared to a more hydrophilic environment. So if we look at our two controls on the, on the left-hand side, um, this is the native protein and the extensively heated protein, we can see that there is a small amount of fluorescence in the presence of the native protein, but a, a greatly increased amount uh, upon, uh, with the denatured control. And then we again examine our uh, stressed samples, both supernate pellets uh, of the particles, and we can see that uh, they vary in their intensity uh, to interact with the dye, showing uh, increases in the apolar environment. Uh, most likely due to either structural alteration of protein in the particles and or, or complexes of aggregate. So to summarize this case study, we can look at the different stresses. There's freeze-thaw, agitation, stirring, and heating across the top. And uh, instead of just looking at the size and, and the number of particles, we can characterize their morphology. We can see that in the case of stirring and heating, there was covalently cross-linked uh, protein through disulfide bonds. And uh, looking uh, uh, on the scale on the bottom of the slide, we can see that the structure of the protein within the particles can vary compared to controls from more native-like in, in the case of freeze-thaw all the way to more structurally altered in the case of heating. Now, uh, we've taken this work one step further in a paper that's recently uh, been published in, in J Farm Sci in 2015 to, to look at um, one um, aspect of, um, of these uh, subvisible particles in more detail. And, 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 and this paper is entitled Physical Characterization and, and In Vitro Biological Impact of Highly Aggregated Antibodies Separated. Uh, into size-enriched fracturations by facts. So in this study, we generated particles by stirring. Uh, we settled the particles, and we characterized them, and that's on the, uh, shown in the flow sheet. We then did a facts uh, separation to separate the proteins by size, and then we uh, assessed their biological activity as well as the physical chemical nature of the particles. Now, I'm not going to go over any of the biological data, I just wanted to give you a brief overview 
of uh, our ability to characterize these uh, particles by facts. And um, this is a, a schematic that shows that we stirred the particles, we sedimented them, we collected the bottom, and then we separated them by facts. And if you look over on the top right-hand corner, this is the facts analysis where we could sort the particles into four different categories depending on uh, front scattering and side scattering of light, uh, which is in, uh, indicative of, of the size of the particles. And the data on the bottom uh, is MFI data that shows that we collected these fractions and sized and counted them. And if you look in the bottom right-hand corner in panel F, you can see that we have sort one, two, three, four, and they are enriched in different size fractions according to the color code. In this work, we uh, then took those samples and, uh, shown in the next slide, characterized them uh, a little more extensively than I showed previously. Uh, we did some similar work where we looked at EM and the FTIR and the ANS fluorescence. But in this case, we also added EDEX analysis to look at the elemental uh, composition and SEM analysis uh, to also look at size. And we looked at that before the fact separation as well as after. And just to highlight for today's talk, on the right-hand side, these are purified subvisible particles collected after facts analysis where we were able to size them. And you can see uh, sort one, two, three, four, and the particles are getting bigger, as you see by SEM, and we can look at their elemental analysis. I'm now going to uh, move on and, and switch topics uh, to case study two. And in case study two, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit more and talk about data visualization tools to analyze uh, particle data. So we're going to uh, use uh, MFI uh, as a uh, model system here to characterize subvisible particles. And I'm going to introduce the use of radar charts to analyze these data. And this paper was published in JFarmSci in, in 2013, as shown in the slide on the right. So typically, uh, you might take readouts of the digital images from MFI and just graph them in a simple bar chart. And that's shown on the right-hand side where we have the concentration of particles on a log scale and different sizes of particles going from 2 to 5 all the way up to 50 to 70 microns. And those are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In a radar chart, we take that exact same data but just plot it in a different way. We plot it around a circle where 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are the different size bins that are shown um, around the circle. And the number of particles uh, is shown uh, on the scale going from the center out to the edge of the particle where each dashed line is a, it relates to the y-axis on the bar chart above. So uh, here we're showing uh, the exact same data plot, plotted both in a bar chart and a radar chart. Uh, so you might say, so what? what what's the, what, what's the uh, purpose of this? And the purpose becomes much clearer when you're looking at a lot of data, and that's shown in the next slide. So in the next slide, uh, we're looking at uh, MFI data from 108 different samples and hundreds of thousands of images. And here we can see, instead of looking at many different bar charts that are hard to compare, by plotting the data by radar charts, we can quickly compare different samples. So here on the x-axis, we have different amount of salts. We, on the y-axis, we have time. And on top, you can see we either shake the samples or stir the samples at different pHs. And we can very rapidly see uh, changes in the particle number and particle size distribution depending on the stress and on the formulation. We can take this one step further and use radar chart analysis to examine the aggregation and particle profile across different size ranges. So here we use size exclusion to look at the small aggregates. We use um, uh, RMM to uh, Archimedes technology to look at the sub uh, micron size particles, and we use MFI to look at the subvisible particles. And we can plot the data around a radar chart. And this is highlighted in the next slide, where we took an antibody solution. We looked at uh, different stresses, heating and stirring is shown on the top, different time periods is shown on the y-axis, different amounts of salt. And we can see visually very quickly uh, 
um, differences in uh, readouts from the different instruments, which gives you an indication of the size profile changing depending on the stress as well as on the uh, formulation as well as a function of time. We can also take radar charts to plot the morphology. Uh, so, so MFI gives readouts such as the aspect ratio shown in the left-hand corner as well as the intensity, and we can plot that data around a radar chart where, uh, as is shown on the far right, we have the different size bins, but we're now showing uh, the morphology of the particles. And if you look at the bottom, we have a plot of the mean intensity or the aspect ratio, and I'm not going to go through the details, but you can see that radar chart analysis enables us to quickly see differences in morphology between particles under different stress conditions. I also wanted to highlight um, that we've recently published a paper taking this uh, one step further, and this is in JFarmSci, published in 2015, where we can calculate the mass of protein in the particles based on the MFI data. And so the current technology to calculate mass assumes that particles are spheres, and so in this work, we remove that assumption, and we actually use the morphology data from MFI to actually determine a, a calculation of the weight. So the particles are no longer assumed to be spheres, but we use their circularity and aspect ratios to um, determine an ellipse to shape uh, circular diameter and circularity. And then we can take that ellipse, rotate it, uh, to model the volume, and we can then calculate the weight based on some assumptions. And the details of that are published in the paper. But the take-home message for today is that, uh, as shown in the next slide, we can now make radar charts that show not only the particle number and the particle size, as shown uh, in the concentration part of this radar chart, but we can also calculate their mass. So we can go look across shaking, uh, two different pHs, or three different pHs, and we can see that the particle number changes, but we can also see that the weight uh, changes uh, depending on the stress and also on the formulation. And finally, in the third case study, uh, I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about trying to better understand the mechanism of how these aggregates and particles form. And in the next slide, this is a summary from a, a review paper by Chris Roberts uh, showing kind of an outline of, of how aggregates and, and particles form. And you can see the first three steps, one, two, three on the bottom, involve subtle conformational uh, changes and, and, and uh, associations of oligomers to form nucleating species. And the key here is that steps one, two, and three often involve um, the formation of reversible species that can be difficult to detect. And then as we go from step three to four, five, and six, we move to the formation of small soluble aggregates and larger particles, and these are irreversible in nature. One of the challenges that we have is many of the analytical techniques that I outlined for you uh, earlier in the talk are really focused on these irreversible aggregates on the right-hand side. And we don't have good analytical technology to detect those early steps in one and two. And in this case study is a, uh, an attempt to uh, develop an analytical method to better understand the aggregation pathway. And I don't have time in today's talk to go into this in a lot of detail, but we're using a GROEL chaperone protein as a detection system for, for these early pre-aggregate species. And just to summarize for today, that uh, chaperone proteins, and GROEL in particular, uh, are well-studied molecular chaperones who in vivo facilitate uh, the correct folding of proteins in vivo. And they do that by misfolded proteins entering the cavity, uh, folding within the cavity, and then being released uh, in an ATP-driven uh, driven process as outlined in, in the schematic on the right. So our idea was to take GROEL, whose role in nature is to bind partially unfolded proteins and see that if we could use that as a detection system for in vitro aggregation. That's outlined in the, in the next slide. 
So on the left, we have native protein, and we have analytical methods to look at native protein. On the far right, we have irreversible aggregates, and we have analytical methods to look at irreversible aggregates. But the species in the middle, these transient species, those are difficult to detect. And the idea is to use GROWEL as a binder to detect their presence. And we do that, in, as shown in the next slide, by coupling GROWEL to a detection system. And in this case, we use BLI, or biolayer interferometry. And again, I don't have time in today's slide to go through the details of this, but suffice it to say it's an optical technique that analyzes interference patterns and re from light reflected from two surfaces, and that pattern changes as the amount of protein changes on these surfaces. So we take GROWEL and we uh, make a biosensor by linking it to this BLI system. And then we tested whether this could be a detection tool to look for aggregates in solution. And this work was published in 2014 in Protein Science. So I'm not going to show you a lot of the analytical method data, but we biotinylated the GROWEL and, and showed that we could come up with conditions to do that stably. We had to optimize the methodology to reduce nonspecific binding. And then we used three model proteins, and I'm going to briefly go through some of that data with you right now. We used FGF, which is a small 16,000 molecular weight protein. And, and the interesting thing about this as a control is this is a protein well known to form molten globule states or partially unfolded states, even under ambient conditions. And it's also greatly step, stabilized by the uh, poly, uh, uh, sulfated uh, polysaccharide heparin. We also looked at some antibodies. So we took the GROWEL biosensor and, 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 and probed in the presence of FGF whether we get a signal. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, this is the readout from the BLI. This is FGF either under ambient conditions or 40 degrees C where it's known to form a molten globule. And you can see that we do get an increase in the signal. And then when we add heparin on the right, we get a decrease in the signal. And the individual steps of this experiment are shown across the top, and I don't have time to go through that today, but uh, uh, it's outlined in, in detail in the paper. But for today's discussion, you can see that there's an increase in the signal, a uh, uh, there's a decrease in the presence of heparin, and as shown in the wash steps on the top, we got full to partial release um, when we added AD ATP, showing that this interaction is specific to GROWEL. Going to the next slide, we then took a polyclonal IgG solution and heated it at 55 degrees, and we did a variety of biosensor measurements, as shown on the left, and we also ran size exclusion. Then, on show, as shown on the right, we correlate the percent total area by size exclusion over time. We can see that there's a decrease in the uh, dimer that's present in the polyclonal mixture, and uh, there was an increase in multimeric higher order aggregates, and that we could see a readout in the GROWEL system um, before uh, we see a readout by size exclusion in terms of um, multimer formation. As another example, we also looked at a monoclonal antibody uh, over short periods of time, and we could see here that there was a signal increase versus uh, our control, so heating this antibody lead led to highest signal. In this case, we also saw that just adding buffer led to a decrease, which told us that might be a weaker interaction between the monoclonal and GROWEL compared to what we saw before. We did see complete release by ATP. And uh, in comparison to size exclusion, we only saw low levels of dimers and multimers, likely because we were near the LOQ of this assay. As a final uh, experiment that I want to highlight for today, we can also take a biotinylating agent that has a disulfide bond in it, and we can link um, the uh, GROWEL to the streptavidin tip of the BLI through a reagent that has a disulfide bond in it. So in this case, we could elute the GROWEL protein complex from BLI by adding a reducing agent. We could collect that complex and look at it by TEM. And in the, um, the final data slide, uh, I, I highlight here for you the TM analysis of the biotinylated GROWEL complex, uh, plus or minus the, the heated map. And you can see on the top, uh, this is GROWEL alone. And uh, on the bottom, 
we have the grow EL with the complex. And in the presence of the heated MAB, and this is highlighted in, in on the right, we can see some complexation of grow EL with what appears to be uh, an aggregate. And we do not see those species on the top. And we're currently trying to better understand this system uh, with experiments in the lab today. So for a summary of this work, we're real excited about the use of GROW-EL as a potential new analytical tool to monitor these early steps of aggregation. And we're also uh, trying to better understand aggregation pathways and kinetics using the GROW-EL system. So to summarize, I presented three case studies, uh, recent work from our lab. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators, both at our center here at KU, uh, Professor Middow, a close collaborator of mine, um, some uh, research staff in our department, Drs. Ozan Kumru, Jay Kim, and Sangeeta Joshi, uh, graduate students, Calvin Colonia and Sarvali Telekapali, uh, another close collaborator, Pro Professor Mark Fisher, who's a expert in, in grow EL biochemistry, and Subhash Naik, a postdoc from the medical school. I'd also like to acknowledge our other co-authors on the published papers, uh, Jansen uh, for contributing antibody, Professor Blaber for FGF contributions, and our financial contributions, including uh, the KBA, Amgen, and the NIH training grant. And again, if you're interested in the work I presented, uh, please uh, go to our website to get more information. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. That was excellent. Um, I think you gave us all some really great insight into the complexities underlying the characterization of protein aggregates and particle formation, uh, as well as a really fantastic look at your elegant new biosensor technique for early aggregation detection. So we thank you for that. Uh, before we move on to Christine's presentation, uh, I just want to remind everyone once again about submitting questions through the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. Both David and Christine will be available to answer your questions after this final presentation. So I think with that, uh, Christine, the floor is now yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today, and thanks for the introduction, Jeff. Today I will be discussing particle characterization of therapeutic protein formulations using image stream and flow site imaging flow cytometry. The way this talk is structured is that I will first discuss some conceptual reasons why we believed imaging flow cytometry would be beneficial for this application. And secondly, I'll show some proof of concept data that validates these conceptual advantages. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. David Vulcan already did an excellent job of explaining why particle characterization of therapeutics is important and what some of the current analytical methods are. I just want to provide a brief scientific background in order to explain why we were interested in developing this application in the first place. So pharmaceutical companies are currently required to monitor particles within injectable therapeutics. Because the original concern was that particles may include blood vessels, limits were set for particles 10 micron and greater because this was considered the minimum particle size for concern. However, many new therapeutics entering the market today are protein-based, which have their own set of risk factors. Because of this, the FDA recently released a new USP test, USP 1787, which is specific to monitoring subvisible particles in protein-based therapeutics. USP 1787 also sets limits for particles 10 micron and greater. However, what's interesting here is that a new informational chapter was also released, USP 1787, which will become active in just a few days, but I recently heard that this was delayed to the end of the year, so maybe not for a little while. USP 1787 is interesting because it recommends characterization of the 2 to 10 micron size range for the first time. By characterization, I'm referring specifically to measuring the concentration of these particles, measuring their size distribution, and finally, identifying the types of particles being measured, as many different types of particles can be present within these formulations, some of which may be more or less harmful than others. The two most important particle types of interest are usually protein aggregates due to their potential immunogenicity and silicon oil droplets, which can form during drug storage in siliconized syringes and are generally considered innocuous. The current methods being used to evaluate the 10 and up micron size range are also being used to monitor the sub-10 micron size range, these methods being light obscuration and microscopy, most commonly used in the industry. These methods are light transmission-based methods and require particles to interact with light in order to be detected. 
Because of this, they have some limitations in the sub-10 micron range in terms of their detection sensitivity and ability to identify particle types, which is especially challenging for detection of translucent particles like protein aggregates. Because of this emerging need to characterize particles in the sub-10 micron size range and the limitations of some current methods, there's been a recent emphasis on the development of new techniques which can be used to characterize particles in the size range. For example, resonant mass measurement has proven very useful based on its ability to measure and discriminate protein aggregates and silicon oil droplets in the sub-5 micron size range. And several other techniques, including flow cytometry, have also been recently proposed. The purpose of this webinar is to evaluate the per performance of imaging flow cytometry using image stream and flow site for comprehensive characterization of particles within protein-based therapeutics. For those of you not familiar with imaging flow cytometry, I wanted to give a brief description of the technique. Imaging flow cytometry can be thought of as a very fast microscope that captures multispectral images of objects in suspension. Currently, there are two types of imaging flow cytometers that are commercially available, the ImageStream X Mark II and the FlowSite, both of which were developed by Amnus, which is now part of EMD Millipore. These systems are very similar in the type of data that they produce. Both instruments produce bright field, dark field, also known as side scatter, and fluorescent imagery of each object at rates of up to 1,000 per second. However, the main difference between these instruments is in the resolution of imagery collected. The ImageStream X is a higher resolution system and can capture imagery at up to 60x magnification, whereas the flow site captures imagery at 20x magnification, and this difference in image resolution is important for some applications. In order to analyze large amounts of high-content image data, AMNIS has also developed IDEA's statistical image analysis software, which allows quantitative analysis of imagery and population-based statistics. Ultimately, it's these two things together, the ability to rapidly collect multispectral imagery with imaging flow cytometry, and the ability to perform quantitative and objective image analysis that has enabled a wide range of applications, in particular, microscopy applications that benefit from statistics and flow cytometry applications that benefit from imagery. The first imaging flow cytometer was released in 2005, and since then there's been a rapid expansion of the technology. Currently, there's over 400 AMNIS imaging flow cytometers installed in over 35 countries, including research, academic, and pharmaceutical institutions, and this technique has been used in over 500 publications. Today, I will be focusing particularly on the advantages of imaging flow cytometry for analysis of particles within protein therapeutics, so please remember that the concepts outlined herein will still apply to a broader set of applications. For those of you from the pharmaceutical world, you may be familiar with flow microscopy, which is the method used by MFI and FlowCam. In many ways, imaging flow cytometry is similar to flow microscopy. However, there are some differences here that render imaging flow cytometry with some unique advantages. One of the most interesting differences is the ability of imaging flow cytometry to collect fluorescent imagery in addition to bright field imagery, which allows the use of fluorescent stains in order to identify particles and evaluate their chemical composition. The use of fluorescent dyes to identify protein aggregates and other types of particles relevant to this application is not a new concept and has been previously performed using other fluorescence-based techniques, such as flow cytometry or fluorescent microscopy. Here in the slide, I'm showing a schematic depicting the layout of Im the image stream system, and the layout for the flow site is nearly identical. Once a sample containing particles is prepared, whether it's fluorescently labeled or not, this isn't a requirement, that sample can then be loaded into the instrument. After the sample is loaded, it is then hydrodynamically focused into the flow cell. This hydrodynamic focusing step is not performed in most flow microscopes, including MSI and HiCam and FlowCam, and is an interesting advantage of imaging flow cytometry because it allows high magnification imaging. With microscopy, there's an inverse relationship between the power of a magnification objective and the depth of field of the plane in focus. So most flow microscopes are limited to low magnification imaging in order to capture focused imagery of particles within a relatively wide flow cell. Once the particles are hydrodynamically focused in the flow cell, they are then illuminated with bright field light and several excitation lasers. When a particle is illuminated by these light sources, a multispectral image of that particle is generated, which contains bright field, side scatter, and fluorescent components. That multispectral image is then magnified using an objective lens and then focus through a series of lenses and filters toward a filter stack. The filter stack then spatially separates the multispectral imagery by wavelength into separate channels on a CCD camera. So the imagery from the bright field light goes into one channel, imagery from the side scatter light goes into the second channel, 
imagery from the first fluorescent fan goes into the third channel and so on. Both the image stream and flow site are equipped with up to 10 fluorescent channels, which allows the use of up to 10 fluorescent dyes in a single sample. Imagery from each channel is then captured using the CCD camera. What's interesting about this camera is that imaging per is performed in a mode called time delay integration, which allows very sensitive collection of light, despite the fact that particles are moving when signal is collected. One reason imaging flow cytometry is a conceptually attractive platform for monitoring particles within protein-based therapeutics is that it can sensitively measure a wide dynamic size range of objects. On the lower end, it's possible to detect very small particles, including submicron particles, due to the high sensitivity of the CCD camera. Because of this, several recent publications have recommended the use of imaging flow cytometry for analysis of microparticles, including a paper by Uta Erdberger in Cytometry A and a paper by Sarah Headland in Nature Scientific Reports, both of which were published just last year. These papers showed that imaging flow cytometry was more sensitive to detection of small particles compared to traditional flow cytometry, allowing sensitive detection of fluorescently labeled polystyrene beads as small as 20 nanometers and biological particles such as liposomes as small as 200 nanometers. In addition to measuring small particles, imaging flow cytometry can also simultaneously image large particles, which is limited only to whether or not that particle can fit within the field of view of an image channel. The field of view for the flow site in image stream systems ranges from 40 to 120 microns, depending on the magnification selected, with lower magnifications providing a wider field of view. Below on the left is a representative image of an 80 micron SU8 particle that was developed by Michael Carrier at the National Institute of Standards Technology, which was imaged using the Image Stream X at 20x magnification. This particle was developed in order to evaluate the sensitivity of image based methods by their ability to resolve four microchannels of decreasing size that have been imprinted onto the center of the particle. If you inspect the image, not only can you see that this large particle has been imaged in clear focus on the image stream, but each of these four ch microchannels can clearly be distinguished by eye. Overall, I think this is an excellent example of how imaging flow cytometry allows sensitive me measurement of small and large particles simultaneously, accommodating the 2 to 100 micron size range of interest for analysis of protein therapeutics within pharmaceuticals. One advantage of image-based particle counters is that the identity of certain particle types can be determined based on the morphology of images collected. This has proven especially useful for discriminating protein aggregates from silicon oil droplets, as both particles have distinct morphologies. However, this approach is only useful for particles of a certain minimum size, which produce enough pixel information for these physical differences to be captured in the image. Naturally, the minimum particle size that can be analyzed depends heavily on the quality and resolution of the imagery collected. As I previously mentioned, because the image stream and flow site use hydrodynamic focusing, it is possible to collect imagery at higher resolution compared to most other flow microscopy systems, which we hypothesized may allow morphological discrimination of smaller particles. In order to demonstrate this, we performed a simple experiment where we prepared samples containing silicon oil droplets or IgG protein aggregates and ran them on the image stream X using 60x magnification, the flow site using 20x magnification, and the MFI 5200, which is one of the most popular flow microscopy instruments used in the industry today. Representative imagery for each particle type is shown for particles 2, 5, and 10 microns in diameter, where each image is scaled to the same size in order to evaluate its quality. If you first look at the image stream X data, you can see that there are clear morphological differences between these two particle types, where the silicon oil droplets are very round and have characteristic concentric rings of high and low intensity, whereas protein aggregates are much more irregular in terms of their shape and texture. What's interesting to note here is that these morphological differences are clearly distinguishable by eye as small as 2 microns. The flow site imagery is lower resolution compared to the image stream data, and is some, it is somewhat more difficult to determine the identity of 2 micron particles. However, the identity of 5 micron particles remains clear. The image quality of the image stream and flow site data is clearly better compared to the MFI 5200, which is no surprise since this is a low magnification system. In the MFI experiment, imagery was only exported for particles 5 micron and up. Therefore, representative imagery for 2 micron particles was not available in this experiment. Because particle identification based on bright field imagery is limited to particles of a certain minimum size, we also explored whether fluorescent labeling would be a useful tool for particle identification. 
In addition to identification of protein aggregates and silicon oil droplets, we were also interested in identifying bacteria. The reason for this is that bacteria are in general quite small, typically being about one micron in size, and therefore represent a population that would be very difficult to identify based on the bright field image alone. Secondly, there may be some cases where measurement of bacteria in pharm pharmaceutical formulations is important, for example, to prove that the formulation is free of microbial contamination. In order to fluorescently label these three particle types, we developed a staining protocol that used three spectrally distinct fluorescent probes. So DIPI, a lipophilic probe, was used to label silicon oil droplets, which are hydrophobic in nature. Proteostat, which is currently sold by Enzo Life Sciences, was selected to label protein aggregates based on its higher stability and brightness compared to more traditional dyes we tested. This dye intercalates into the beta sheet structure of protein aggregates, where it undergoes a conformational change that increases its fluorescence. Finally, Cyto62 RNA stain was used to fluorescently label bacteria. The staining protocol developed was very simple and only requires mixing of the staining cocktail containing all three fluorescent dyes at the appropriate concentration with the sample for 30 minutes. We actively pursued development of a simple and wash-free protocol, as washing steps are not only challenging for small particles, they also may affect the final number and size distribution of particles measured. In order to evaluate the specificity of these probes, we performed a simple experiment where we have prepared samples containing silicon oil droplets, protein aggregates, or bacteria, and fluorescently labeled each sample using the staining cocktail. After fluorescent labeling, multispectral image data was then acquired using ImageStream X or FlowSight and then analyzed using IDEAS. On the right-hand side, representative imagery of each particle type is shown for particles 10 micron in size, which was collected using the ImageStream X at 60x magnification. For each particle, five images are shown, which from left to right are the bright field, the side scatter, ODIPI, proteostat, and cyto images. If you inspect these images, you can see that each fluorescent probe is indeed specific to its intended target, meaning that the silicon oil droplet is mainly positive for green bodipi stain, the protein aggregate is mainly positive for red proteostat stain, and the bacterium is mainly positive for purple cytostain. However, the identity of these 10 micron particles is also relatively clear from the bright field imagery. The real question is, does this fluorescent labeling help identify particles which are difficult to distinguish using bright field imagery alone? In order to evaluate this, we took a look at smaller particles. Here, representative imagery of two micron particles collected from the same samples are shown. In this case, it's much more difficult to determine particle type based on the bright field imagery, although it still may be possible to make an educated guess. However, if you take a look at the fluorescent channels, it's very clear what the identity of each particle type is. For example, the top particle is clearly positive for Bodipi, identifying this particle as a silicon oil droplet. This experiment indicates that fluorescent labeling is indeed a useful tool for discrimination of smaller particles, especially sub-5 micron particles, which are currently challenging to identify using flow microscopy. Once image data is collected using ImageStream or FlowSight, the next step is to quantitatively analyze the idea using IDEAS software. What IDEAS does is that it provides quantitative morphometric analysis of large numbers of images using features related to the size, shape, texture, and intensity of these images. Because imaging flow cytometry is well-suited for a wide array of applications, IDEAS is an open platform software which has over 85 base features, 14 masks, and allows creation of custom features. Taken together, these provide a robust set of tools so that virtually any difference in imagery you can detect by eye, you can discriminate quantitatively using image analysis. Because of the versatility of IDEAS, wizards are also available for validated research applications which walks the user through an optimized analysis template step-by-step. In order to demonstrate how IDEAS works, on the right I'm showing two images of protein aggregates about 10 micron in size collected from different samples using ImageStream X at 60x magnification. The top sample shows an IgG aggregate and the bottom image shows a lysozyme aggregate. Both types of aggregates were purchased from Enzo Life Sciences and generated using a combination of heat, stir, and chemical stress. Three images for each particle are shown, the bright field image, the fluorescently labeled proteostat image, and finally the side scatter image. When looking at these images, it's apparent that there are significant differences between the two particles within each channel. The IgG particle has higher contrast in the bright field channel compared to the lysozyme particle, the lyso with the lysozyme particle being nearly invisible in the bright field image. However, the same lysozyme particle stains much more brightly for the proteostat compared to the IgG particle. Finally, the lysozyme particle has a lower side scatter intensity compared to the IgG particle. <laughs> 
Ideas can then be used to quantitatively measure these differences using the relevant features, which in this case were contrast for the bright field channel, median pixel intensity for the proteostat channel, and median pixel intensity for the side scatter channel. The values for these features are displayed below each channel and agree with the qualitative differences that we can see. So relative to the lysosome particle, we can see that the IgG particle has about 20 times higher bright field contrast, about five times lower median pixel intensity in the proteostat channel, and about 30 times higher side scatter median pixel intensity. However, these are two only two images that I've shown, and it's not clear at all if these images represent the majority of particles within each sample or if they're simply outliers. The real power of imaging flow cytometry is that large data sets can be collected, which allows statistically robust measurements that also capture the variability within the sample. When dealing with large data sets, population-based data can then be displayed using histograms and dot plots as shown here on the right. On the left, a histogram showing the frequency of lysosome particles in red and IgG particles in blue is shown for the bright field contrast feature. Again, we can see that the entire population for lysosome particles has a lower bright field contrast compared to the IgG particles, which agrees with the representative imagery shown. On the right, for the same populations, a bivariate dot plot is shown, which plots the proteostat median, and median pixel intensity on the x-axis and side scatter median pixel intensity on the y-axis, and each dot represents an Im individual image. Again, we can see that the entire population of lysosome particles generates higher proteostat intensity and lower side scatter intensity compared to the IgG particles. Using these dot plots and histograms, the user can then apply regions to the plots in order to define populations. One nice thing about the software is that imagery is linked to the plots, so it's possible to click on any bin in a histogram or dot in a dot plot in order to see the associated imagery which is a very useful tool to visually validate the features used or positions of regions. Once an analysis template is developed, the final analysis of data is a statistical analysis of the features and populations defined. For example, comparing the median and standard deviation of a particular feature of interest between samples. On a side note, I think this data set is very compelling because it clearly demonstrates that some types of protein aggregates may be especially difficult to detect using light transmission-based techniques such as bright field imaging, as we saw with the lysosine particle, but it may be possible to detect these particles more easily using fluorescent labeling approaches. In our experiments, we found that fluorescent labeling also proved useful for measuring interactions between different types of particles. For example, proteostat fluorescence allowed us to detect protein absorption to the surface of silicon oil droplets. To demonstrate this, we performed a simple experiment where we prepared a sample containing silicon oil droplets only and a sample containing silicon oil droplets that have been mixed with monomeric protein, and fluorescently labeled each sample using the staining cocktail. Representative imagery of silicon oil droplets for each sample is shown. Four images are shown for each particle, which from left to right are the bright field, bodipi, proteostat, and finally a composite image merging the bodipi and proteostat channels. Highlighted in the yellow box for each sample, it's apparent that a ring of proteostat fluorescence is localized to the surface of silicon oil droplets that have been mixed with protein, but not for silicon oil droplets alone. The ring of proteostat fluorescence indicates that protein is absorbed to the surface of silicon oil droplets, and that protein has been fluorescently labeled with proteostat. Again, when looking at the bright field imagery by itself, there's no, image, there's no evidence that protein absorption has occurred meaning that fluorescence labeling is critical to measure this interaction. Ultimately, the, the ability to measure protein absorption to silicon oil droplets may be important to some researchers as protein absorption has the potential to render silicon oil droplets with immunogenic properties and may also affect the stability of the formulation. Fluorescence labeling was also, also useful for measuring larger particle-particle complexes for example, particles containing both protein aggregates and silicon oil droplets, it's known that heterogeneous particle interactions can lead to further particle formation. For example, the presence of silicon oil droplets can induce protein aggregations. Therefore, the ability to measure these particle complexes can be useful to evaluate sample stability. To demonstrate this, we performed another simple experiment where we prepared a sample containing all three types of particles, so protein aggregates, silicon oil droplets, and bacteria, and then fluorescently labeled the sample using the staining cocktail. We then collected multispectral imagery using the image stream X of 60X magnification, and finally used ideas to identify particles that were positive for two or more fluorochromes. Here are representative images for some of the complexes that we found. 
The top set of imagery are for particles containing both a silicon oil droplet and a protein aggregate. The composite image merging the proteostatin bodipi channels is shown on the far right, which clearly shows a silicon oil droplet labeled in green nestled into a protein aggregate labeled in red. The bottom set of imagery are for particles containing all three particle types, where the base is a silicon oil droplet, which has a surface layer of protein absorption, and finally a bacterium. In the composite image shown on the far right, this time showing bodipi and cytoimages, it's clear that a small bacterium labeled in purple is attached to the surface of a silicon oil droplet in green. In both cases, I also want to point out that it's quite difficult to identify this interaction when looking at the bright field image alone. Therefore, this experiment demonstrates that fluorescent stains can be a useful tool for identifying these types of interactions using imaging flow cytometry. So far, I've focused on the abilities to identify particles using image morphology and fluorescent probes. Now I want to switch gears and talk about particle quantitation. Ideally, an instrument used for analysis of particles within therapeutic protein formulations should accommodate a wide dynamic concentration range so that sample dilution is not necessary. Sample dilution is generally undesirable because it can affect the final results, for example, by causing disaggregation or aggregation of particles. To evaluate the linear concentration range of the instrument, we started off with a sample containing 3 micron fluorescent beads that was highly concentrated and then prepared serial dilutions of that sample. Image data was then acquired for each of these dilutions using the image stream X, and the number of beads within each sample was measured using the objects per mole feature and ideas. The image stream and flow site load samples using a volumetric syringe pump, which precisely controls the volumetric flow rate of the sample during image acquisition. Therefore, the concentration of the sample can be calculated by dividing the number of particles measured by the total amount of volume processed. Here's a graph plotting the expected particle concentration on the x-axis against the concentration of particles measured using the image stream on the y-axis for samples ranging in concentration from 300 to 30 million particles per mil. Excellent linearity was measured across this concentration range spanning five orders of magnitude, as seen by the R-squared value displayed on the plot that is very close to one. To compare this dynamic range to the current gold standards in industry, this upper concentration limit is about a thousand-fold higher compared to Hayek, which is linear at up to 18,000 particles per mil, and about a hundred-fold higher compared to MFI, which is linear up to 175,000 particles per mil. This indicates that the need to dilute samples would likely not be a concern with imaging flow cytometry. A second advantage of the image stream and flow site is their relatively low sample volume requirement. Both systems can load samples anywhere between 20 and 200 microliters. As a frame of reference, the HIAC requires about 1 mil of sample, and the MFI requires about 500 microliters of sample. Ultimately, this low sample volume requirement means that it's possible to conserve precious sample when performing this assay. One last set of data that I want to show you is comparative data of counts measured for IgG protein aggregates using the Image Stream X, MFI, and HAC. One challenge for measuring protein aggregates is evaluating the sensitivity of the analytical method used because validated reference standards for protein particles are not yet commercially available. Often, the sensitivity of instruments is evaluated using polystyrene beads of known size and concentration. However, these beads are in general easy, easier to detect compared to protein particles due to their higher refractive index. It is possible to evaluate the sensitivity of one instrument compared to another by measuring counts on each system for identical samples. This approach has been taken to compare sensitivity between MFI and HIAC and has shown that the MFI is more sensitive is a more sensitive method to detect protein-based particles based on its high, based on the higher counts that it produces. Similarly, we also performed a comparative study measuring the concentration of IgG protein aggregates of known mass concentration using the Image Stream X, MFI, and HAC. Sample concentration ranged from 62.5 to 1 microgram per mil aggregated protein. Each sample was then fluorescently labeled using the staining cocktail so that particle detection using fluorescence could be performed with the Image Stream X. A particle free sample containing filtered water was also prepared to ensure that counts measured were not due to background counts and also to show that the fluorescence labeling process was not introducing particles itself. Here is a radar plot that shows the concentration of each sample measured on each instrument in log scale, with the Image Stream X concentration in blue, the MFI concentration in green, and the Hyatt concentration in yellow. For each sample containing protein aggregates, particle counts were 3 to 11-fold higher for the Image Stream X compared to the MFI, and 500 to 1,000-fold higher for the Image Stream X compared to the Hyatt. Counts for the particle-free water sample were lower than 100 per mil for all of the instruments, and counts were actually lower using Image Stream X compared to MFI. This indicates that the increase in counts measured on the Image Stream X is not due to false background counts, 
and also that the fluorescence labeling process itself does not contribute significantly to the counts measured. This data demonstrates that the ImageStream X provides higher sensitivity for detection of protein aggregates for this particular sample compared to MSI and HIAC. Of course, these differences in sensitivity are related to the particle properties and can be more or less significant dependent on the size distribution and nature of the particles within a particular sample. So to summarize this talk, imaging flow cytometry offers several qualities that make this technique a potentially attractive platform for analysis of particles within therapeutic formulations. Because imaging flow cytometry is a high throughput technique, large sets of image data can be easily collected, allowing the analysis to be statistically robust. These images can then be analyzed using IDEA's image analysis software, which allows quantitative and objective interpretation of the data. Imaging flow cytometry allows collection of high resolution and high quality imagery, facilitating analysis of particle type, even for small particles in the sub-10 micron range. Particles can be detected using fluorescent or side scatter signals, which can allow sensitive detection of particles difficult to measure using light transmission-based techniques. Imaging flow cytometry can accurately measure highly concentrated samples, which can avoid the need for sample dilution. Finally, the image stream and flow site systems have a low sample volume requirement, which can allow a precious sample to be conserved when performing this assay. So we at EMD Millipore thinks that imaging flow cytometry is a very promising technique for analysis of particles within protein formulations. In order to facilitate adoption of this method by researchers, we are currently developing a fluorescent labeling kit for this application, which we expect will be available this fall. The kit will contain some of the fluorescent labeling probes used in this webinar, so it will include proteostat for detection of protein aggregates and BODIPI for detection of silicon oil droplets. Positive and negative controls, including aggregated and monomeric IgG, will also be included so that you know whether your experiment has worked. And finally, we plan to develop an analysis wizard for discrimination of protein aggregates and silicon oil droplets and ideas, which will likely use both bright field and fluorescent images in order to perform the final classification. I also just want to remind you that particle analysis is only one of many applications possible with imaging flow cytometry. Here's a list of some of the most common applications that imaging flow cytometry has proven useful for. However, this is by no means a comprehensive list of what is possible. Finally, I want to thank everyone that attended this webinar, either today or in a future recording. Here's my contact information on this slide, so if you have any questions or comments for me about this application or imaging flow cytometry in general, I definitely encourage you to reach out to me. And now I'd like to pass the presentation back to Jeff so that we can answer any questions that you might have. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Thanks, Christine. Uh, really interesting stuff. I think you showed everyone not only the power and the versatility of the imaging flow cytometry platform, but also the potential the system has across a wide array of disciplines. So we thank you for that. Uh, before we get started uh, with the Q&A session, I want to let everyone know that this is your final chance to submit your questions for our speakers. So hurry up and submit them now. I also want to let everyone know that a post-webinar survey uh, will deploy in your presentation manager uh, in a few moments, so you may need to disable your pop-up blockers. Uh, if you would, please take a few moments to complete the short survey, and we really value your feedback. So uh, let's begin the Q&A session. I'm already seeing a few questions starting to roll in, so why don't we start answering a few of them, and we'll try to get to as many of them as uh, we can. Okay, and our first question is for uh, David. Uh, David, one of our um, audience members would like you to define your difference between stirring and agitation. Uh, sure. Uh, stirring refers to the use of a, uh, a small stir bar to uh, stir the solution, and agitation re refers to um, using a shaker where the, where the protein solution is put in a glass vial with the stopper and then is shaken. So that's the difference between stirring and agitation. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to give you another question real fast there, since that was a pretty easy one, I think, for you. Um, uh, why uh, is it more analytically challenging to measure protein-based uh, subvisible particles? Well, uh, the, the challenge there is that um, historically analytical instrumentation has been um, calibrated uh, using polystyrene beads or uh, hard uh, spherical beads. And uh, they are beads that um, do not have the same physical properties uh, 
as a protein particle. And, and as you could see on some of the slides I showed of the, with the TEM and the MFI digital imaging data, the protein particles tend to be uh, translucent and amorphous and, and have a different uh, morphology. And, and because of that, it can be a challenge to measure the uh, size and number of those particles because um, it is difficult to uh, compare them to the standards used to calibrate the equipment. The other challenge is um, the solution properties um, can also affect um, how the aggregates are formed, but also our ability to detect that aggregates. And so as one example, the, um, the refractive index of the particles versus the refractive index of the formulation or the solution they're in, uh, the difference between those two values can affect the readout in the assays. And then finally, um, real quickly, um, I, I think one of the other challenges is, is thinking about what is the purpose of the analytical test? Are you, are you trying to get rank ordering, uh, a qualitative assessment of samples, or do you need the real number of the actual number of particles? And so all those, um, all, all those uh, topics kind of are interrelated and in that and makes it challenging to uh, analytically determine the number of protein-based particles, subvisible particles. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Uh, so, Christine, the next one is going to be for you. Um, is it possible to use fluorescent dyes in order to evaluate the material properties of protein aggregates, for example, to measure their hydrophobicity? Um, yeah, this is absolutely a possibility. Um, so, for example, we've used bioflavin T and been able to measure that on the imaging flow cytometers, which is a measure for hydrophobicity. Um, basically, there's up to 10 fluorescent channels that the system can image. So as long as your dye falls in a separate channel than what's being used to detect the protein aggregate, then you should be able to measure that chemical property separately. All right. And there's another question for you, Christine. Um, someone wants to know, what is the minimum particle size where protein aggregates and silicon oil droplets can be discriminated from one another using imaging flow cytometry? That's a really good question. Um, so obviously validated reference standards for protein aggregates don't exist. Um, but my feeling is that you can, first of all, detect particles at least one micron and up. But the classification is interesting because what happens, as I showed you earlier in the presentation, is that protein absorbs to the silicon oil droplet, which basically um, gives that silicon oil droplet a little bit of proteostat fluorescence intensity when it's been labeled. And then for smaller particles, basically because they have a high surface to volume ratio, this layer of proteostat on the surface can cause overlap between the fluorescence intensities of the smaller particles. So our feeling is that ultimately we're going to use a combination of morphological parameters based on the bright field image and fluorescent parameters in order to be able to discriminate these particles um, and we're still working on this development. But our goal is to be able to discriminate particles 2 micron and up using the image stream and 5 micron and up with the flow site, at least. OK, great. Uh, David, we have another question for you. Um, one of our audience members wants to know if the Grohl EL assay is more sensitive than the ANS assay for the model protein studied. Uh, okay, the um, the short answer to that question is uh, I don't know. Um, the little longer answer is, um, you know, that, that would be an interesting thing to evaluate in the future. Uh, what we're trying to balance here is sensitivity, but uh, that is versus uh, what I might call specificity. So um, the that that what I what I mean there is the ability to detect these small amount of aggregates versus our ability to know where they are along the aggregation pathway. And the thing that we like about GROWELs, it really helps us with that second part. We know that we're looking, uh, I mean, that first part of the pathway. So uh, it helps us know specifically what we're looking at. While ANS might be a little less specific in terms of what aspects of the protein aggregation path that you're looking at. But we don't know the answer about sensitivity when comparing the two assays, that is, what's the lowest level of aggregate that we could determine? Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think this is going to be all we're going to have time for. One last question for Christine. Uh, Christine, uh, did you ever try to measure protein aggregates using imaging flow cytometry without using fluorescent dyes? Um, yes, we have tried that because we realized that some researchers might want to not use fluorescent dyes in, t in order to identify their particles. Um, which is very similar to what's done using um, flow imaging techniques like MFI. Um, the challenge we faced here was um, basically that we had higher amounts of background counts using the bright field channel and also the side scatter channel um, for a particle-free control sample. And what this means is that you have to start applying a threshold in order to detect what's your particle and what's background. And um, ultimately, we found that this threshold would um, setting this threshold would possibly remove some of your particles of interest by counting them as noise. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for that. And I think with that question, we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived for six months on our website at uh, genengnews.com. So if you've missed parts of it and you want to watch it, or you want to watch it again, uh, or feel free to forward the link to friends or colleagues, uh, we would recommend that. Uh, I'd like to thank David and Christine again for not only their informative presentations, but also the audience as well for their uh, attention and uh, thoughtful questions. Um, and I'd also like to give a, a very special thanks to EMD Millipore for sponsoring this webinar. And hopefully we'll see you all again at another Gen Webinar in the near future. So goodbye for now.